Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSB exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to access control in Domain 4 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the seventh of seven videos for Domain 4. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a pint-sized part of our complete CCSP masterclass. Access controls are the collection of mechanisms that work together to protect access to the assets of an organization. These access controls can be both physical controls, like locks, and logical controls, such as a login mechanism to access an operating system. Access controls essentially enable management to specify which users can access what resources, what operations they can perform, and provide individual accountability. There are three major principles that we apply throughout access control. The first is separation of duties, to divide up key processes into multiple parts assigned to different people. That's segregation or separation of duties. Need to know and least privilege are very similar. Only give users access to what they need based on their job and nothing more. But there is a subtle difference between them that you need to know. Need to know is focused on restricting a user's knowledge, access to data, to only the data required for them to perform their role. Whereas, least privilege is focused on restricting a user's actions to only perform those required for their role. So that's least privilege. Now, some terminology. An entity is a single unique person or process that can have multiple associated identities. Identities vary according to context. So an entity, such as a person, can have multiple identities, such as a work identity and a personal identity. An identifier is a means by which an identity can be asserted, such as a username or an ID card. Identifiers are just how you uniquely identify a specific identity. I'm sure that helped clarify for you. All right, attributes are information associated with an identity, such as a name, address, role, phone number, etc. Here's a diagram that will help you visualize what I'm talking about here and the relationship between all of these. An entity is a person or a process. An entity can have multiple identities. Each identity should have a unique identifier, like a username, plus some attributes like job, role, title, phone number, email address, etc. Okay, now let's talk about the access control services. There are four major services that all access control systems must provide. Identification, authentication, authorization, and accountability. We'll start with identification. This is where the user must assert their identity to the system. For example, my username is rwitcher. I'm a user asserting my identity. Authentication is where the system verifies the user's identity via one of the three factors of authentication, knowledge, ownership, or characteristic. Authentication by knowledge, also often referred to as something you know, is where users verify, prove who they say they are by providing some information that they have memorized. So authentication by knowledge is information that someone has memorized, like their password or a security question. The second factor of authentication is ownership, also referred to as something that you have. Authentication by ownership is done with things that we have in our possession, such as a hardware security token like a YubiKey or a phone with an authenticator app on it. Authentication by characteristic. The reason we call it characteristic and not just biometrics is there's actually two main categories of characteristics that we can look at for authentication, physiological and behavioral characteristics. Physiological characteristics include things like your fingerprints, iris, retina, and that's what we often refer to as biometrics. While behavioral can be things like how we walk, how we talk, how we type. These are behavioral characteristics. Okay, so we've now discussed the three factors of authentication, knowledge, ownership, and characteristic. Single factor authentication is simply using one of these factors. So if you just log in with a password, that is single factor authentication. Or if you just access a building by scanning your retina, that is 
single factor authentication. Multi factor authentication means using two or more, listen carefully here, different factors of authentication. So logging into a system with your password and a one time password from an authenticator app on your phone, that is multi factor authentication, two different factors. What about logging in by entering a password and then answering a security question? Is that MFA? A password is authentication by knowledge. And answering a security question is again, authentication by knowledge, the same factors. So that would be considered single factor authentication. Watch out for that on the exam. Now let's talk about authorization. This is where we define a user specific access within a system, what they are authorized to access. And this is where we'd apply those principles like least privilege, need to know, segregation of duties, etc. The final most important access control service is accountability. To have security, we must ensure that users are accountable for their actions in the system. We need to know who is doing what. Okay, we're now going to talk about two major types of systems that will allow users to access multiple different systems with a single set of credentials, single sign-on and federated identity management. Both of these systems will allow that. So both of these systems allow users to access multiple systems with a single set of credentials. Users, of course, love this. They can now only need to remember one terrible password instead of multiple terrible passwords for different systems. And they'll need to authenticate once to magically get access to a bunch of different applications. So what's the difference between single sign-on and federated identity management? Single sign-on systems only allows users to access systems in a single security domain, systems within a single organization. Whereas, as we'll talk about in a moment, Federated identity management protocols allow users to access systems across multiple security domains. The one major single sign-on protocol that you need to know about is Kerberos. Kerberos enables authentication via tickets over an insecure network and allows users to access multiple systems while only having to authenticate once. So Kerberos is a single sign-on protocol. Okay, now moving on to the important part, federated identity management as I just mentioned, allows users to access systems across multiple security domains. What does that mean exactly? It means that users could say log into Spotify with their Google account or authenticate to their corporate actor directory server when they log into say their laptop and then access multiple cloud services provided by other companies without having to log into each cloud service separately. Super convenient. Federated access relies on a trust relationship between three entities the user, the identity provider, and the service provider. Essentially, the service provider needs to trust the authentication that is being performed by the identity provider in order to authorize the user to access the service. Uh, let's dig into these three entities. The first is the user, sometimes referred to as the principal, and this is obviously the user that wants to log in. The identity provider is the entity that authenticates the user, verifies the user's identity via authentication by knowledge, ownership, or characteristics. In many organizations, the identity provider will be something like, say, Active Directory. So the identity provider is what authenticates the user. The service provider, sometimes also referred to as the relying party, is what the user wants to access. The service provider is often not an application owned by the organization, but rather an application owned by another vendor, something like a software as a service. So think about software as a service applications that so many of us access through work nowadays by, you know, submitting help desk tickets through ServiceNow, booking travel, entering expenses, etc. We do this, we use software as a service applications all the time. And federated identity management allows us to access all these different services without having to log into each one individually. There are a number of different protocols that enable federated access. The major one that you need to know about is SAML, the Security Assertion Markup language. As we talked about, Kerberos relies on this idea of sending tickets. SAML does the same thing, but it doesn't call them tickets. Rather, they're called tokens. Same thing though. These tokens contain assertion statements, things like the user ID, the service ID, timestamp, lifespan of the token, and other information that would allow the relying party to make an authorization decision. Assertion statements contained within tokens are written in XML, the extensible markup language. There's three other protocols that you should recognize as being federated access protocols or federated identity management protocols. WS Federation, 
which provides both authentication and authorization. And OpenID, which provides only the authentication. And OAuth, which provides only the authorization capabilities. OpenID and OAuth are typically implemented together. So know about, recognize those other three as being federated data management protocols. Privileged user management is the practice of carefully managing the permissions of a privileged users because these users have a greater degree of access than normal users would and therefore can cause the compromise of their account can be way more damaging, which means that we need to much better scrutinize and more frequently review their access and make sure that they don't have any unnecessary permissions. Secrets management is the practice of appropriately securing high value secrets like passwords and keys over their lifetimes. And the final item in this mind map here, a cloud access security broker, CASB, is a security solution that sits basically like a proxy that sits between cloud consumers and cloud service providers to enforce security policies and protect data. CASBs provide visibility into cloud service usage for organizations. It allows them to monitor user activity, enforce data security policies, and detect threats. CASBs can help with data loss prevention, encryption, access control, and compliance ensuring that the use of cloud services across an organization are appropriate. CASBs enable companies to protect sensitive data, prevent unauthorized access, and ensure that cloud usage, again, aligns with corporate and regulatory requirements. So that's CASBs, Cloud Access Service Brokers. And there you go. That's an overview of access control within Domain 4, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the CCSP exam. Mm -hmm.